Jean-Denis, thank you very much for, for this nice presentation. Um, it was very, very good. Uh, We're heading now to Q&A uh, session. First, I would like to give word to the people who already posted on our platform uh, uh, questions before the before the session or now during the event. So Peter asked, uh, can you push national laws and legislation to repair the minimum damage uh, EV batteries? In my country, there are a lot of rusty damaged ones. After an accident, it can be hazmat landfill only. And as a, an introduction, I say that I think that says like 99% of, of the batteries should be uh, of little damage batteries should be repaired or reused, I think. So, um, yes, first of all, um, two things. The first is that sometimes, uh, yes, like I said, we are, we are striving to repair the batteries. And in most cases, when the battery comes to the repair workshop, we are repairing them. And that's actually around 90, 99% of them we're repairing them. But there are some, some, case, some cases, I'm talking about Renault, in, in which we don't, uh, the battery from a crashed vehicle is not sent to the, the workshop when it's, uh, the car has suffered a, a, a strong uh, shock and then um, we are not uh, sure about what happened inside the battery, even though it does not look like it's damaged and it's, it's, it seems to be working, but may, may, maybe there could be some um, fault inside that may trigger, uh, if we put them back into the car, if we repair them and put them back into the car, that may trigger some some uh, what we say a thermal run away, basically start of a fire, very dangerous. And so there are, we have some uh, safety rules that say that beyond a certain level of shock in terms of a crash, if there is a violent crash, some batteries will be scrapped or actually recycled instead of being repaired or reused, even though technically they, it seems they could be repaired or reused. Just because um, it's still a recent uh, recent uh, ev evolution of the industry, and we don't have enough feedback to be able to diagnose always uh, very uh, deeply what happened inside the battery in case of very very uh, serious shock. So that's first explanation about some cases of batteries that may look may look like they are. They, they are just slightly damaged or, or even not damaged at all and why they will be recycled. Nevertheless, we are working on it so that we are we will be able to salvage more of these batteries. So basically to have much more accurate di diagnosis of crash batteries. The second thing is about regulation. <clears throat> so um, indeed, uh, well, th there's no regulation of this kind. And uh, to be honest, that there's not there, there's no regulation about even repairability of the battery, whether it is designed to be repairable. And that's um, that's becoming to be a problem because some newcomers on the market, you know, the industry for for more than uh, 420 years have been very. I mean, repairability has been a, an essential value of the car industry. I mean, uh, there's hardly any more repairable product than a car. The cars are lasting today around 20 years on average in Europe. And that's not accounting all the cars that are exported to other countries in Africa or elsewhere that will still be running for 10, or 10 years or more. <clears throat> so cars are really uh, designed to be repairable. They are repaired actually because they last very long. But we see that some newcomers in the, in the market are just, they don't care about it. So just to reduce cost, they are coming with batteries that are not repairable and there's no regula regulation that uh, uh, that prevents that. So it's, uh, it's a shame, but it's like this and it's cheaper. So people will buy them, buy these cars without knowing that the battery is not repairable. Sometimes the car itself is hardly repairable. So, so far, there's no regulation about it. Um, and personally, I hope that, that, that yes, it, it, will, uh, it will come soon because that's uh, 
that's a shortcoming of the current regulation and particularly battery regulation. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for this answer, Jean Denis. Uh, we are heading to the next question. Uh, next question was from Shumar Mazair. Floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jean Denis. Uh, pleasure attending your talk and, uh, and listening to your, your insights. I am uh, more an academic. Uh, I'm a professor here at Schema Business School in Lille, in France. And I have a background in engineering. And so I have been studying those circular economy initiatives since my dissertation 10 years ahead. Uh, then at Benkila, I started a project uh, which was uh, about uh, studying uh, circular economy initiatives in innovative industries, like where the products change. And this uh, part is still, I have some questions about that, that how circular economy, in essence, it promotes reuse, recycling, on, on the whole product, components, or at the material level. Now, combine it with the with our innovative nature of, of the industry, like the products change every few years, there is new design coming in. How would you integrate those two things? Like imagine, you, especially if we talk about like uh, made to be remade initiatives, like using your material to make the new cars, which is definitely the future. Like uh, the full, is, uh, the car, like the limit, there is limits to whole product manufacturing, remanufacturing all that. But then if you are trying, we are trying to rebuild our vehicles from the one which we used post consumer use, there are design changes. Uh, some products become obsolete. Do you think it's it's going to be a future challenge? Like, is it in the mind of, of executives at Reno? What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, yeah, there are two aspects. There's recycling and reuse. For recycling, this is not so much of uh, an issue because basically we take the materials back and then we get them back to the, the specifications of, uh, of the, the, the new car we want to make. The only issue we have is sometimes of legacy substances that may have been authorized in the past and then they were banned for, banned for some reason. And so... It might be the, the, the might be a challenge uh, for recycling, especially for plastics. If the new regulation says like there's you have to have zero ppm of this substance, so we we always say that um, of course uh, hazardous substance must be banned. But then in case of recycling, uh, zero is, is not feasible. So it's just the right level. Of which is really usually very very low and, and, and harmless uh, should be defined of uh, so that we can recycle the the, the plastics from all vehicles. But um, so this is for recycling. Uh, it's true that the technologies change. So like I said, for instance, uh, now uh, well some materials that are essential for ice vehicles are not essential for electric vehicles and the other way around. But nevertheless, the materials that are come out of end-of-fly vehicles can be used in other applications, and we can use uh, materials from uh, electronics or uh, other sectors that to, to make the batteries for electric vehicles. But um, so that's for recycling. So what you say, it's not big, so it's such a big issue for recycling, except that, of course, when we have such a big change as the now the, the switch to, uh, um, to electric vehicle, uh, it will take decades be before a significant share of the materials we need for the batteries can come from our end of life product. We think yeah. like because yeah, that's obvious because we have a, especially because we have a very long life uh, long, long lifespan for it. Now for reuse, yes, it's a very big challenge, of course. So we made this reuse, but as long as uh, there are vehicles on the road of the same model as the vehicles that are ending their life. So basically, uh, when when you launch a new vehicle, well, you, you don't have uh, 
if the vehicle uh, needs some repair, you won't have the, the replacement part of this model. Then comes a time when you can have the, the, the need and the, the, the parts for replacement from Second Life. And then comes a moment when you have a lot of end of life vehicles, but you don't have a need uh, anymore. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, no. Frankly speaking, I cannot say it's on top of mind of the 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 the, the, the industry, and uh, I don't believe there will this will change. To be honest, what um, also I have to to clarify, if needed, that uh, no one and we are not using secondhand parts in new vehicle new vehicles for various reasons, but sometimes even regulation is not helping. Even to put, uh, you know, tire. Tire is relatively standard, but relatively standard. Finally, when we launch a car, you know that the energy consumption or fuel consumption is really essential. It has to be optimized, so the the tire must be optimized to the car. So even that uh, makes it difficult so far to use uh, re refurbished tires because we are starting starting to sell. I know we've been starting a few months ago to sell refurbished tires in our after-sales network, but for after-sales only so far. Uh, so far, it's difficult to, to, to use refurbished tires in, in new cars. Of course, if we did, we would say it will, either it would be an option that the client can choose, either it would be very clear that the so yeah. refurbished tire, you know, it's equivalent to the new one, except that it's not exactly tuned to the, to the model of the car unlike the, the new tire that we put on the, each specific model. So, uh, yeah, there might be some exceptions as of, of standard components like the tire maybe, but generally speaking, no, it's an issue that will, I'm afraid, will remain for a very long time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Denis, and thank you, Shumail. Uh, we are going towards other, our next question from our colleague. He says, uh, I would like to know your point of view on the design and needs of the recuperation of precious and rare materials from car electronics. Uh, furthermore, which particular policies should be implemented and is a convergence on standardization of the car producers possible? Also, uh, in Renault's experience, what are the main difficulties of harvesting these metals in the recycling process and how have you solved them? And the last one is as a circular economy person, is there an ideal thing that should occur among the stakeholders to make the path towards circularity easier? So yeah, very good questions because indeed electronics are really, uh, I can say a pain point of the, I can say uh, of the, the circularity of cars for various reasons. First, uh, the materials, indeed, the electronics are full of exotic materials in, in small amounts, very small amounts. And um, electronics is, I mean, the cars are, modern cars are full of electronics that are spread everywhere. So it's uh, not always uh, possible or not, or not always worth uh Dismantling, getting the components, electronic components back during the, the manually during the dismantling process for recycling because they have so small amounts of precious metals and, and you don't even uh, necessarily know how much. Even uh, we don't know, for instance, how exactly how much gold there is in our cars. We know there is very little gold because gold is very expensive, but we couldn't even tell where it is and exactly how much. So that's first first challenge is knowledge. Indeed, to have a very detailed um, declaration of all the precious um, and critical metals there are, there is in electronic components. Second is transparency of the supply chain. The electronic supply chain is very complex, very long, and very unfamiliar to us. So uh, we need this transparency to have this kind of uh, declarations on on the on the the, the 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 content, material content, to have the also to be able to secure sometimes the, the some materials because for instance lately China has been banning or not restricting the export of gallium and germanium. Gallium and germanium they are materials that are used in extremely small amounts 
but nevertheless in many applications, especially in chips. And then uh, when uh, China announced that, and there was uh, some, uh, not a panic, but some worry that like, uh, are we safe? Will we have, a, you know, this uh, chip crisis again that made us lose maybe 1 million, uh, the production of 1 million vehicles in, in several years. So finally that, that, so we've been able to know where more or less where we have this, these materials but uh, not ex well. It's difficult to to know exactly who is using using it, where it comes from, and third, it's also very difficult to to exact to measure or even estimate the the carbon footprint or environmental footprint of these electronics to know in what conditions they are produced, whether it's responsible or not, etc. So there are many challenges electronic in electronics, and of course. One of them is uh, indeed recycling because when you have, when you have all these components spread all around the car and in uh, and and uh, you don't even know exactly the amount of um, uh, each metal there is inside and there are so metals that are present in such small quantity that you it does not it, you don't have a, a recycling process that would make it worth to get the or possible to get these materials back some of them like Calium, Germanium, and, and many more, and uh, even silver, probably, well, I'm not sure, but, and, 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 um, and yes, indeed, the, the, the dismantling process uh, would make it very, very difficult to, to, to get all these electronics back, so, and, and the, the, the post-shredding process, the post-shredding sorting, can of course it can get the can sort the electronics more or less, but basically some materials will be lost in the process. So there there is no no ideal so far no ideal uh, way of dealing with it, but there is a significant margin for progress. So in the project of um, of uh, new vehicle circularity legislation in Europe. There is a plan to make the dismantling of some parts mandatory, which uh, could make sense in some cases for, for when uh, the shred, post-shredding sorting cannot have uh, the same level of uh, material sorting than uh, the, the manual, uh, than if we extract, if you extract the part in the first place. And that could be the case for some, in some cases, for some electronics that so uh, for, for so, uh, some kind of electronic components, it could be worth indeed having to dismantle them or ex ex extract them from the car systematically before, before the recycling. But still, that will be difficult to, to, to recycle all the materials from, the, from these electronics. We'll have uh, the, the gold, the platinum, the, the silver uh, will be recycled, uh, maybe hopeful hopefully tin, but you know, some of them are used in such small amounts that, that they are not recycled today and it will be very difficult. And that's not for cars only, that's for electronics in general. And for legislation, um, yes, like I said, uh, having to, to, grow, to, to making it, uh, helping uh, us having the traceability of the supply chain, uh, Maybe some kind of eco design of electronics, but not only for cars in general, uh, and 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 uh, also maybe uh, trying to reduce the, the the use of some materials that will that are very critical uh, and will not be recycled eventually. Uh, many thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to pose a question concerning uh, the. Um the catalyst recycling from end of life vehicles. Uh, like, first of all, does it constitute a problem that given the high the dynamic nature of catalysts, they might not be all in the same state, so to say, after several years of employment. So like uh, in one catalyst might occur a sintering, sintering a phenomenon in another catalyst, like a phase change, et cetera, et cetera. So like in this regard, does it constitute a problem in terms of regeneration than process of these commodities? Like how do you face the standardization of the regeneration process given the high dynamic nature 
of the commod of the materials you have employed in the end of life cycle vehicles. Mm -hmm. Like you have uh, showcased this example of the platinum or collagen was base catalyst that then was recycled into fuel cells uh, for. It will be. It is not today. Okay, so it's sorry, uh, pipeline project. And um, so, how do you face this problem of also standardization and if it is exist? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, um, actually, for for the recycling of catalyst, uh, as far as I know, no, it's not a problem. I mean, the diversity, the different diverse uh, history of the catalyst. We are working with uh, mainly with uh, two or three companies like uh, Hensel Recycling in, in Germany for, for dismantling, uh, mechanical separation, and then uh, Johnson Matty uh, for the, the chemical uh, refining. And they, they get uh, really these materials, so platinum, so rhodium, palladium, yeah. back to the so same work. level, equivalent level of uh, <laughs> Properties, quality, purity, as the the the, mm -hmm. the, the ones from the the mines, and they are they are reused the back into catalyst in significant amounts. So no, for recycling, as I'm not aware that this is a problem. However, we've been considering the the refurbishing of catalysts, and this was the problem. Uh, I wish we we could. Um, Take it to the well uh, to 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 to, to uh, a uh, concrete uh, implementation, but our engineers said um, that if we didn't know exactly the story of the catalyst, we could not do it. They would not actually warranty, and so we stopped. So for for recycling, it's not a problem, but indeed, if you by regeneration you mean regenerating the catalyst to be reused, yes, it is. And uh, another thing is that. Uh, we have a very strict legislation on uh, the uh, level of pollution of the cars we put, the new cars we put on the market. So there's always higher level uh, amount of uh, uh, platinum group metals in the catalyst. So high that some now it's, it's uh, some some are being stolen, you know, on the street. They will cut your catalyst just to to steal it and sell it for the the materials. But uh, surprisingly, the legislation is, uh, I don't know if it's not so strict or if it's not applied in after sales, some, some, some multi-brand after sales network are replacing if the client comes to with a car and needs to replace Catalyst. Of course, if they come to our network, we will put the same, same equivalent Catalyst with same level of depollution. But in some multi-brand networks, you can have a very cheap Catalyst that will have very few uh, platinum, platinum materials, but basically your car will be uh, emitting uh, maybe 10 uh, or 20 times more pollutants than originally. So uh, this should obviously be forbidden. It's not, or at least it's not controlled. And uh, so basically uh, when we collect the, the catalyst at the end of life or in the after sales network, we, are, we have some surprises that we find this kind of um, catalyst of uh, uh, unbranded catalyst of for after sales that uh, have very low levels of of uh, platinum group level. Thank That's you very it. much for the detailed answer. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for this answer as well. Uh, our next question was from our colleague uh, Veronica Davidov. Veronica, do you want to? Sure. Yes. Um, so yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, the question that I had was, um, so as, as I was uh, mentioning, we've been kind of conducting research and interviewing people on these topics for uh, quite some time now. Um, one thing that has come up time and again, uh, once we started interviewing um, different kind of sustainability experts, not necessarily car experts uh, or working in the industry, but um, got a sense that there's a general impression that cars with um, electronic components are harder to adapt to a circular economy than older cars because there's so many compound or composite materials that are harder to disassemble and get the different metals out of and um, 
uh, whether it's logistically harder or more expensive or companies will have less incentive to do that, it's a concern. And I was curious what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, but first of all, you know, electronics in cars, the growing amount of electronics in cars is not so much linked to the fact that cars are getting electric. I mean, there's yeah. a huge amount of electronics now in, in conventional cars. So um, electric car is not necessarily worse, if I may say, than conventional from this from this uh, standpoint. And of course, it's much better from other standpoint, like the general carbon footprint and, and air pollution. But uh, then, indeed, electronics, uh, and, and there are some, indeed, uh, some aspects of the, the previous question, electronics, that I did not address, which are uh, about repair. Uh, well, so first of all, yes, indeed, it's difficult to separate the materials. They are really intimately linked uh, together and in small amounts. So it's a nightmare, basically, to, to recycle. So some of them will be, will, will be recycled, some will not be. Some uh, electronics will never come to the recycling plant. So that's one of the one of the the, the, the aspects. The, the the second is about circular economy, about repair and reuse. So indeed, electronics uh, are much uh, more challenging than other like mechanical parts or other parts of the car from these uh, these standpoints. For various reasons, first of all, they change all the time. You know, they're evolving all the time. The generation, so that also points out from the question from from uh, Schumann that yes, it's even worse for electronics that you may have. You know, in the in the life of the car that uh, will be produced during seven years, you will always have maybe the same engine or e motor, the same components of such. But the, the electronics you may have like four four different generations of components in the same car. And you hardly know, you, you know it if you, you have a really very close follow-up. So then you cannot necessarily use the, the component, electronic component you use from a, a car of the, to repair another one from the same model because uh, finally it's different. And also it's not always, uh, or in many cases, it's not designed to be repaired. We not design them. We not produce these electronic components, uh, and it's not designed to be repaired. And also, it's usually produced most of the cases in low cost countries, and um, which makes it very challenging to have a business case to repair, refurbish them, because basically we will refurbish them in in France or Western Europe with high very high level of salaries, and basically. Uh, just the time to make the diagnosis, uh, and it's uh, more or less you get to the same cost than uh, the, the the new component cost. You know, it's like you you come with a electronic device to the repair shop, and very easily it does not worth repairing because it was so cheap originally, or and it's so expensive to diagnose and repair it in our country. So of course that's very very challenging, but uh, nevertheless we we are starting to do it in some. Uh, uh, essential and costly components of the car, also some components that we are involved in 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 their design, and not just uh, standard components uh, that are purchased and that are the same for for various car makers, and that will be, uh, I mean, spread across the the car in in many functions. Yes, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, bonjour, Jean-Denis. Uh, mm -hmm. I had three questions. Uh, I'll stick with one only <laughs> for the sake of time and give some space for the other uh, people. Um, you, you you, talked, uh, I was more interested about the, um, uh, the collaboration and partnership within the industry uh, on these topics. You mentioned the, uh, you, you're at Renault, you, you're doing some work with different companies uh, to, to, to build up solution with the four areas that you mentioned but what about the over car makers because to my view and I, and I think at an industry level you need to reach certain volumes and certain scales for the sustainability to be efficient to be able to recover more material of industry etc so is there can you shed some light on potentially some discussions or initiatives that you're working um, uh, with over car makers thank you 
Thank you. Um, well, yes, first of all, yes, indeed, we have many collaboration with, uh, with large companies, with medium scale or, or startups. And, and um, so far, uh, we, we don't, I don't think we have um, significant collaboration with uh, competitors on this specific area of circular economy. However, of course, it makes sense to have economies of scale. And that's the idea behind the creation of this uh, subsidiary, this holding called the future is neutral, which is it's, it's a subsidiary. It will not be owned 100% by Renault. There will be other investors. And it's intended to deliver circular economy services for other car makers like uh, recycling, but also well, end of life vehicle management, battery. Uh, collection, management, and recycling, battery repair of Second Life, and uh, also um, remanufacturing of uh, automotive components. So that's really uh, the idea to scale up, uh, uh, so have some collaboration or, or, or provide the circular solutions to other car makers and scale it up and optimize the whole stuff by working for various car makers. That's the, the general idea behind this. Uh, and also, uh, like I said, in the refactory, in the refurbishing and repair workshops, we, we, we can handle various brands. So we've been discussing with competitors, no, no, no agreements so far, but basically we are very open to have some agreements like we could handle the, the refurbishing and repair of the, the, the cars from, uh, used cars from other brands in a certain uh, perimeter around the plant, so in Paris region, for instance, and um, for instance, the the same for battery repair, and maybe this other car maker could be be could do it in in other country, like in Germany or in other parts of uh, of Europe, mainly. Boris. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question was, was from uh, Rafael Schmidt. Thank you very much for the insights and taking the time. To increase the amount of recycled content in the products, it is especially important to persuade the suppliers and partners. How do you get them on board and how do you track the degree of circularity? You know, three or four years ago, it was very difficult because basically... Uh... We were striving already to, to increase the share of recycled materials in our cars, but that was not the case of the majority of suppliers, and they did not have equivalent requests uh, from um, most of the other car makers. So if you if you are the only client of a supplier to request for recycled materials, and they have six or ten other clients that do not request it, you know, in many cases they have only one production process, especially for plastic, for instance, and they cannot uh, afford to have uh, two different materials, one recycled for Renault and one a, virgin, one a virgin for the other ones. So indeed, yes, it's challenging, uh, we, but now it's getting better. First of all, because most of the suppliers, if not all the, the tier one suppliers are now, now willing to work on, uh, to incorporate recycled materials, uh, use low carbon materials. So they come to see us to propose to collaborate also with our closed loop recycling activities, making it better. They also have this kind of request from other car makers, not uh, still may maybe not the majority, but at least we're not alone. And also the regulation is coming, especially for plastics. The regulation will request a minimum level of uh, recycled plastics in the cars by. 2031 or two, uh, requesting uh, well, the project uh, is uh, what the draft would request 25% of post consumer recycled plastics in, in new cars, which is a lot. Because of what the 20% I mentioned for, 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 for Renault 5 is not post consumer, it's all, all recycled plastics, in, including post uh, industrial, we say pre consumer, uh, or, or out of which 10% from post consumer. So if the legislation comes to 25%, that would be two and a half times what we have in the, the best vehicle on the market. But anyway, yes, so it's getting, uh, of course, we have to motivate uh, suppliers. And uh, yeah, it's getting better, it's getting better. We are collaborating, it's getting easier to collaborate. Some of them 
are really proactive and coming with very um, very uh, ambitious projects, collaborative projects, especially, uh, well, I won't, won't say a name, but anyway, we have some very nice projects with some of them. Um, and also we need the, you know, the customers to show and the press and to show interest and to show that they care about having sustainable and recycling materials in the cars because that's an essential argument for us within the company to convince the engineers, the purchasers, the suppliers to put them these recycling materials into the cars. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I think first on the on the previous comment from uh, Jean-Denis about uh, yeah, buying uh, circular cars, I think this is also a question of knowing um, how much circular the car is. Uh, because if the consumer do, don't know actually how circular the car is, then they can't really actually favor it over an, a non-circular car. Very good point, and I forgot to address one last point of the, the, the previous question about how do, how do we track. Mm -hmm. So first of all, how do we track? We, we, we have declaration from our suppliers. For the plastics, it's quite well traced, but frankly, we cannot trace it all the way from the waste. So, uh, and we can do it alone, uh, cannot do it alone. We, we need to, to have the whole supply chain working this way and establishing traceability. So I, I hope we hope that the new European regulation will help um, having the, the standards and the, the traceability and the declaration and the follow up, the audits, whatever is needed, uh, because we cannot do it alone. And second, indeed, for the first time now, well, I, I showed you the, the slides about the, the, the new Seniki Tech Electric, the Renault 5. So now we are starting to communicate strongly about this. But uh, you know, we say 40 kilograms of plastic, 20%. The client does not know. Is it good? Is it not? The fact uh, is that uh, if, if the others don't say, especially the ones that are uh, really bad on this, you cannot compare. Yes. So, yes. The regulation. Yeah, regulation, the regulation so. should really make it mandatory to, to declare and set some standards. We lack standards to define what is circular, what is uh, recycled material. Even recycled materials for plastics is more or less defined, but you know there can be margin for interpretation. But for metals, it's not. Like I said, now we define that there is recycled and circular because actually there is uh, suppliers, they don't declare recycled materials. They, def they declare different types of scrap. And then it's up to you to find out if you can call this recycled or not. So, so we would really need a standard that say, well, this is recycled, this is not, and uh, this is how it should be controlled and audited. And we can, of course, contribute financially to audit. But if we pay uh, for the audits of everyone, of course, alone, that well, that won't work. So yes, yes well, there shouldn't be like kind of a, a label like there are on uh, fridges and you know A B C D. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, for this, yes, for this matter. But you know, not even a label, just a standardization of uh accounting mm -hmm. and mandatory declaration mm. but based on clear standards okay sorry that wasn't my initial question Enough, my ahead. question was about um tires uh because i guess that this is maybe a part which is not necessarily coming back to a factory sure. because um so is there anything that uh you are doing to recover tires and creating materials such as carbon black to actually manufacture new tires? So the, the tires, they, they are recovered anyway because there, there are some uh, product on PROs, product responsibility organization for every tire we put on the market on our cars or there is some uh, um, recycling fee that is paid to the PRO that will collect them. But there is currently no actual recycling process for tires in the sense that, I mean, if you look at the statistics, some tires are recycled, but they are not recycled in the sense that the materials are re, will be reused to make tires or, or something equivalent. So that's a ch technically challenging. And, and I've seen on the press that uh, I think Michelin with uh, one of who has started uh, 
inaugurated a bio recycling plant. That would be a very good news. What we are doing now is that <clears throat> we are collaborating on the, we, we, like I said, for the first time, we are the first car maker to start selling refurbished tires. When I say refurbished, I mean, it's like remanufacturing. The tire is uh, basically, uh, they, 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 it's used, you know, but they, they end up removing all that that is, uh, remains uh, of the, the rubber layer. And they put a new new one. The structure is kept, so eighty percent of the materials are kept. They put a, a new a new rubber layer, which is really at very high standards. Uh, and it, the brand is called Leonard. Leonard. It's a really um, innovative in the sense that it's produced in the north of France, in Béthune, in the former Bridgestone uh, tire making factory. It's a tire factory that used to produce new tires of a premium brand. And, and now, uh, so it, they end, ended to, to make it, and it was purchased uh, by an actor, the, the last actor in front of the tire refurbishing. And now they make it with these industrial processes of the, 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 the new, like equivalent to the new premium tire. And this is how we could have them technically validated because that was challenging and took some time. That's how we could have them technically validated to sell them in our after sale after sales network. We would like to be selling them also to be putting them in some car new cars. Uh, but uh, like I said, it's uh, so far for various reasons, legal reasons and all. It's 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 not possible so far. So, but anyway, refurbishing is a very very good uh, very, very good solution for tires. And of course, uh, yes, there are some recycling initiatives. To be honest, we are not involved in in, in these because that's really, I mean, uh, the the tire manufacturers are really uh, at the initiative on this kind of. They have to do this, and I know there are some uh, recyclers of carbon black, and it makes a lot of sense because carbon black for tires, I, I think, uh, it came significantly from Russia. So since the war in Ukraine, it was a bit uh, of a challenge and uh, well, you know, an issue. And uh, also, it's uh, have a higher uh, carbon footprint to produce. So of course, makes uh, a lot of. Uh, but we, to be honest, we don't. That the tire is one of the parts, maybe with electronics, that we control the less in terms of mm. production process because the the that we don't have a yeah the tire is adapted to our car in terms of consum fuel consumption. But basically, the tire is standard. We don't have a special specific tire made upon our specifications in terms of material content, eco design whatsoever. So of course we 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 exchange a lot. We try to collaborate with uh, tire manufacturers, but we are not really uh, uh, we we don't have a lot of control on this. That's what we, we lately we've been uh, we've taken this initiative on uh, refurbished tire because this is something we can do. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so thank you very much for the um, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it and covered a lot of uh, gray areas. But uh, I'm going to be asking my question um, in a more biased way towards uh, raw materials mm -hmm. and not just on the recycled materials. So my, um, I'll first start with the background that you need to have enough raw materials in circulation before you can recycle. But um, we know that due to the challenge of climate change and also our, um, and, I mean, the global plan for carbon neutrality, recycling has to be part of our everyday life. But then we have to practically understand that we still need supply of primary materials. And then the question is going to be that, where do we reach that point whereby there's a balance between knowing the quantity of the primary materials that we need in circulation to be able to support the game of recycling such that we can reach almost 100% recycling? Or maybe if we don't reach 100% recycling, how do we get that balance such that they could be, you know, good, uh, they could be realistic you know, plan 
to be able to marry the supply from mining industries or primary production and extraction companies with those involved in the sector. Because this is going to be a big challenge if, for example, everybody faces recycling and then suddenly, where do you get the materials? The primary materials are recycled. Where do you get it from if, for example, you know you have too much people in the recycling sector due to the fact that we are trying to shift towards circularity and then we have less people because we try to discourage those who are into the primary production and then in the end, we'll see that there may be a problem with switching sustainability. So this is... Do you mean that question. by developing recycling or, or making all the efforts on recycling, we make we may not have enough the virgin materials? Yeah, what I mean is that if we don't kind of properly define a balance between when we have these primary materials being supplied into the market, with also the numbers of, of, of recycled materials, then there may be a problem of imbalance. So my question is about how do we actually strike that balance? between yes. the supply of primary yes, materials. But you, you mean an imbalance in what sense? That excess of, of recycled or not enough recycled or, or not enough raw material? Not enough raw materials to be recycled. Yeah. The, the point is, um, I'm not sure this is the, the issue in the sense that um, currently, uh, we, I mean, the, the world, that, that our society, the whole world is extracting uh, um, huge amounts of raw materials, always growing. And uh, in, uh, uh, in general, not, not talking specifically about the automotive industry, but in general, very few are recycled. Officially, and the statistics are that around 7% only of the, the, the materials uh, used in the world are used the are recycled. Uh, for instance, for plastic, the huge amounts are, are are not recycled, and even for for electronic, like like we discussed. So uh, basically, our uh, of course we're striving to develop uh, recycling, but we are starting from a situation where where we depend massively on extraction of raw materials, mining and, and oil extraction. And, and then recycling is very marginal in general. And um, the balance, I mean, there's no balance, but uh, basically if, if, if the, the, the recycled materials are taking the place of uh, virgin, I mean, materials from the extraction, it's good. It's good because it allows to, I don't know if it allows to reduce mining, but at least, you know, the trend of extraction like this, at least it, it can, allow to, to stabilize it and maybe someday to reduce. Because anyway, if we talk about copper, for instance, within uh, uh, one or two decades, basically, we, we, we maybe less than that, we will not be able, there won't be enough copper to extract and keep the same path and meet the, the, the demand, not because of recycling, but because the, the, the mines are getting as well exhausted uh, and uh, and maybe uh, also copper is not used in a circular enough way. So the, if we can recycle more copper, for instance, for copper automotive is a good example because copper is one of the materials that is not recycled from cars. I explained we have a closed recycling loose, but still we extract manually from uh, the, the cars during dismantling process, but some part, significant part remains in the body and then only well, some significant share remains is the steel, and it's a con copper is a contaminant for steel, and it's a precious, very useful material that we need. So we need to improve the recycling of copper from end of life vehicles, and uh, this will certainly not cause an imbalance in the sense that this will, uh, how to say, uh, demotivate the extraction of copper. It's just that hopefully. If we improve recycling of copper, we may have possibly enough copper for everyone. Because if we don't, we won't have enough copper, whatever we extract, because the old mines are getting exhausted. And for 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 uh, uh, battery materials, that's uh, basically this balance will come naturally 
that um, so far anyway, you know, we don't have enough batteries to recycle. So we rely mostly on extraction, but then gradually uh, the batteries will come to the end of their life. We will recycle them. That will be some additional, uh, they will be used in, in, in mixture with virgin materials from extraction, like it is the case today with uh, copper, with all materials, basically all metals. They are used to get a mixing recycled with uh, mining materials. So this is the way the materials, the battery materials uh, value chain uh, is building itself, uh, combining extraction with recycling, but recycling will take a lot of time to, to grow and take a significant uh, share on the market. So uh, frankly, no, I'm not, if I understood well your question, uh, there's really, I mean, the balance comes naturally, but uh, unfortunately so far the balance and for a very long time, the balance will, 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 will be uh, still very much in favor of virgin materials and extraction over recycling because recycling represents and for some, for a long time still will represent a small share, a minor share of the needs for the automotive industries and for other industries. Hopefully we'll come from maybe 20% to 30, 35, 40%, but you know, still the majority of the materials will come from extraction. I don't know, don't know if it, that answers your question more or less. Hope. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jean Denis. It was a really, really great uh, event. Uh, thank you, thank in the you. name of uh, Ed Riders and the whole project. Thank you for all the participants to participate in this and uh, to to ask uh, to ask questions. Um, just like uh, to say a few few more things. Uh, I will uh, in next week. Send you everyone an after uh, email, uh, after event email with the recording so you can check it again. And uh, I also shared with you uh, the link to our platform of the event where I invite you that uh, uh, you discuss with other participants, um, maybe post your own opinion. Um, this will help us a lot uh, in the research. Thank you very much. Thank and... you, everyone, for your attention. Pleasure. Thank you. So, Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.